Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome to this next episode of The Therapy Show with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. And we're going to look behind closed doors and what happens in the therapy room. And in this episode, we thought we would look a little bit about how to find a therapist. Mm. Whether there's a good therapist or a not good therapist, the different types of therapy, what's it all about? <coughs> Over to you, Bob. So one of the things that I often talk about is the therapeutic relationship to me is up at the top of the list. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Well, it is up at the top of the list. I agree with you. Good. I agree with you on that. I'm not disagreeing with you on that. <laughs> and, and for people who want to come to therapy, I'm not sure if they think about that. I think uh, people come to therapy because they're driven by the discomfort in life. Yeah. And I'm not sure they think, well, I'm, I must go to therapist to have a good relationship with them. And, you know, I'm not sure about that one. But I do know they're usually driven by the discomfort in their own lives. Sometimes they're told to go, which is, I don't think is a particularly good way to go. No. Uh, sometimes somebody might say, well, you need therapy, like somebody came along and said that to me and I went obediently went into therapy, but it was driven by my own discomfort. And I think that's what takes people into the whole world of looking for a therapist and a counsellor because yeah. their life is so painful or discomforting to them. They want to, to change that. I'm not sure, Jack, if they actually think, well, you know, the method is going to be, you know, like what you've just said, we must seek somebody who's got a very good relationship. You see, I think that's more in the world of the therapist or the counsellor themselves because they've been trained that way or, yeah, usually it's because of that. Um, I don't think there's so much about that from the client's perspective. See, the reason why I ask that question is because... I hear a lot of people saying, I, I've been to therapy before, I've had counselling before and it didn't work and, you know, for whatever reason. And it kind of boils down to the fact I didn't like the therapist. But oh, you know, yeah, but they poo-poo the whole of therapy because they didn't like that person. Yeah. Therapy was that, working and it didn't work. Jackie, that's a different question. That's right. If someone's been before the counselling and therapy and they don't get on with the therapist the counsel or counsellor and therefore it doesn't work that I can easily imagine them saying that to you and of course they've said that to me many times that's a different however if you're talking about the first time somebody ever goes to therapy and counselling then I think it's a different story yeah and so following on from what you said then What's your thoughts around people waiting for a crisis before they go to therapy or the idea that we should all have a therapist? I, I, I'm, my fantasy is in America, everybody has a therapist of some description that they go to. It's a matter of course. But in this country, often we wait for a crisis before we access well, there's two questions there. I'm going to take the first assumption, which I don't think is true. So I, I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to blow your fantasy about America. <laughs> I actually believe if you go down to many, many of the deprived, deprived places in America, whether it be from the lower ghettos, whether it be in the Bronx of New York or whatever, they have no more, they might... They might wish to have somebody to talk to, but they have not got the money to be able to afford a therapist. They're so poor, they're not able to even think about um, the, uh, the ability of therapy. And they may look at the sort of uh, rich, affluent New Yorkers or the uh, liberal right or left wingers in California. And I, I don't know, but they haven't got the money for therapy. In fact, if you look at, and this is a political way we could go down it but look at Obama Barak's idea of extending health care 
into all areas of, uh, of the American culture and look at where Trump took that and how much he, he denigrated that whole process because of the how much it cost went to another whole political story. But I do know there's many, 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 many swathes of people in America who could no longer afford therapy and counseling and fly. So your fantasy about, I think, is quite centered on the people who can afford therapy. Yeah, quite possibly. And then yeah. it's openly discussed. And that's a different story. Yes. I think, I think you know, the, the idea that all, all actors have got money and people in the li liberal uh, right or left in, in different parts of America who, who have got that type of money, that, that, that I think your fantasies hold water a lot more. Um, so I think, again, America is the have and have not. So the have people, therapy is much more popular, it's much more accessible, it's talked about as a way of dealing with mental health problems in a much more accessible way than the United Kingdom. Yes, but right. I, I did mention America then, but I, I would imagine the listeners will be thinking that that happens over here as well, that there is the haves and the haves nots, you know, and, and often therapy and is seen as a privilege or an expensive thing to do. Yeah, same problem, isn't it? Yeah. I think it's more acute in America, so the differentials, differentials are much bigger. Yeah. And it's a much bigger country of 500 million people, where there's 67 million people in the United Kingdom. But at a macro level, the same problem. Yeah. You know, the underclass of the UK can't afford it. I, you know, I run, or the Manchester Institute runs a low cost clinic where we subsidize people to be able to come for £15. Yeah. Those people under £14,000. And there's such a large outcry of it. But in general, people haven't got the money. But let's let's go to your second question, which is much more around, you know, uh, well, we could stay on the first question. Let's, but I'll go to the second question, which I think is therapy is much more popular nowadays. You know, when I first went for therapy in 1983, it was not as popular as it is now in the United Kingdom. It wasn't as accessible as it was now in the United Kingdom. And it was much more of a taboo, it wasn't discussed. 2021, we have a different situation, but it's still for the middle class, I believe, unfortunately. Yeah. So going on from that, the other question that I said was, what's your thoughts around, I know what you were saying, what brings people to the therapy room? But would you say that most people come because of a crisis because my thoughts around this are that when people are in crisis you're dealing with an awful lot of emotion and you know everything's quite traumatic so for them to to fully engage and to hear and to connect can be quite difficult if they've been through a trauma if there's a sudden death or you know whatever it is what are your thoughts on if people went to thera therapy when things were okay? I think it would be marvellous. Me too. Well, I'm not, glad we agree on that one. <laughs> and it's not the case. No. I think I say to, the, to my trainees, I say to many people, look, you know, the best time to come to therapy is when there's not a crisis in your yeah. life. And then you're, you're going to be coming far more from the here and now uh, to be able to deal with some of these processes. And your defence systems may not be so um, entrenched. Yeah. However, very rarely does that however, work. However, Bob, with you, there's always a however. I yeah, remember however. that from my training. However. <laughs> it doesn't really work out that way. <laughs> Most people I know wait for a crisis. Yeah. So very rarely, very, very rarely do I have somebody who comes in and says, well, actually, you know, I feel I'm in a good state now, so I, I feel able to talk about therapy. Occasionally that happens, and I say bravo. Usually people wait for a crisis or a stage in their life which they find so excruciating painful that they turn for help. Yeah. But you're right. If people could come from a different place where they can say, oh, right, now I'm feeling okay. Um, I think it's a good time to look at the trauma in my life that I've had or... But usually people say, and I think this is most unfortunate, Jackie, most people say, or a lot of people say, oh, I'm feeling okay now, so we'll just carry on in life as it is. Yeah. 
And I can remember, I'm not sure whether I've said it to you before, when I was doing my training, I actually said, God, this is really depressing. Can we not have some good news? Is there nothing good in any of these books? And you quite rightly said to me, people don't go to therapy when everything's going okay. We can spend a full weekend if you want to, Jackie, on all the good stuff, but it won't be any help to you when you're seeing clients. And it no, was a valid no, point. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, people will, will come to therapy in the main when there's a crisis. Yeah. And there we, we can go on from there. So let's we've we've kind of covered a little bit about what brings people to therapy. I'm very, you know, protective of transactional analysis because I do like it. It fits well with me. Um, I like, as we've discussed before, I like diagrams. I like structure and it fits really well with that. But there are a zillion different types of therapy out there and as a therapist i'm confused by them so you know for somebody that's scrolling through google looking for a therapist how would you advise them to pick well let's just start at the beginning uh, you're right most people come to therapy i think there's a crisis and most people want to get healthy as quick as possible yeah so they don't want to spend endless time in psychotherapy or endless time in psychoanalysis five or six times a week where they're spending 300, 400 pounds a week or whatever it is. They want to get cured, if you like the word cure, which I'm not sure I do, so I said healthy, as quick as possible. Yes, within one session, please. If not, before. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and unfortunately... From, as it's to do with psychological and emotional problems and not like, oh, I'll go to the doctor who's got earache, I'll get some tablets or I'll get some optimizer or whatever it is and I put it in two times a week and my ear or the infection in my ear gets treated pretty quickly in two or three days and everything's hunky-dory. That's not how it is with emotional psychological problems. Otherwise, people will, will never come to therapy. So, uh, so, so that's where I think most people come from. They want to be cured as quick as possible. The truth is that's that that's not possible particularly. So, what have you got in the United the, the UK? We have what is um, put forward by the government as a panacea for all illnesses, and and believe it or not, very very quickly, and that's cognitive behavioural therapy. Now, usually, if you're very fortunate you might get up to about 12 sessions of what we call CBT and uh, as, uh, as uh, is sold on the packet by the government, that should do the trick. Now, in my business, we get many, 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 many people who have CBT and actually it hasn't worked or they haven't got better because it doesn't deal with the past and it doesn't deal with the emotional world of the past and it doesn't deal with trauma it doesn't deal with depression. It deals basically with uh, invasive thoughts uh, and behaviours which you might be able to change from the distorted thinking. Uh, OCD it's not too bad with, but for, for most of us we need a therapy that deals with the traumas of the past I believe. Yeah, I always say that it's kind of solution focused. It's this is the problem and I want to move forward. Okay, so this is how we do it. Mm. But often with clients that have come to me, they just move that into a different area of the life. So it's kind of like if I'm struggling in work or whatever, you sort the work stuff out, mm. but then that same issue will move into a different area because of all the background stuff. It, mm. That's often what drives our behaviour. Mm. Absolutely. So... To answer your question, I think it's it's going to be very hard to cure somebody in six sessions, 10 sessions, 12 sessions. You might be able to help somebody deal with different coping mechanisms. Yeah. And you might be able to help people with diff different behaviours. But whether those behaviours would stick is another story, even if they, even if they are the right healthy behaviours. And if we are going to help people get different coping mechanisms, whether we can do that and 10 to 12 sessions, I'm not so sure. Unfortunately, again, 
NHS, if you, a lot of people turn to, will only give you about, if you were lucky, uh, six to 12 sessions, and you might have to wait a year for that. Yeah. So hence why people turn privately. One, because I believe they want more than CBT offers. Secondly, they want to get cured quicker, but they want to deal with the emotional past. Um, and thirdly, often CBT hasn't worked. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't want to slate CBT because I think it has its place. It's, it's, a, it's a good start. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And there, there are some people I would imagine that that, okay for. that works fine. Yeah. But yeah. My issue with it, if I do have an issue, is that people who go through the NHS and use CBT and it doesn't work have then got you know a belief that therapy doesn't work it doesn't work it won't work for me it's rubbish and it's about finding a different type or a different person there's so many nuances to getting a good fit with this and I always say to me if it doesn't work first time move go to another one you know don't stop therapy altogether it just means that that bit didn't work for you don't give up on it couldn't agree with more so you're right in the, it, it, there is about, I think in the latest uh, Wendy Dryden book, looking compared to ther therapies in the United Kingdom, there's about 700 different types of therapy. But you can oh put them- God, different, honestly. Yeah, you can put them to different camps though. Um, you can look at the therapies that deal uh, exclusively with behavioral change. You can look at the therapies that, that deal exclusively exclusively with cognitive change you can look at the therapies that deal exclusively with spiritual change you can look at the therapies that deal exclusively with physiological change and you can look at the therapies that deal exclusively with emotional change so you can start splitting them up into different camps now i think that actually uh integration is probably the best process where uh, we're looking at integration or change and also I think looking at how the past affects the present is what a lot of lot what a lot of people in my um, clinical practice want yeah yeah replaying the same behaviors and and kind of bringing all that stuff with them yeah of course there are some uh some uh, counseling or therapy people might turn to uh, a bit more specifically. So if they've had, uh, uh, you know, someone die or a bereavement where they got stuck on the bereavement cycle, they can't handle life or don't function very well, they'll turn to somebody specifically for bereavement counseling, for example. Yeah. If they've got eating disorder issues, they might turn to a specialist for eating disorder counseling. You know, so there are specific um, specialists you can turn to. But if you're talking about generally look at, looking at trauma and how the past affects the present and developing new coping mechanisms and making new decisions to take charge of your own life, I think it's more around psychotherapy, which looks at how the past is played out in the present and then going from there. So moving on, again, I think it's quite relevant in where we are at the moment. How do you rate face-to-face -face versus online or telephone therapy. I've even heard that you can have therapy via text message now. Yeah, you can have therapy via text message and it's actually quite popular uh, or getting more popular. And uh, also e email therapy and Zoom therapy and Skype therapy. You can, get specific, you can even get specific therapy for people who lose their phones, for example, over, <laughs> over, over email. So- I should. I shouldn't laugh at that. that yeah, no, 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 you know. So social media has taken over a lot of the way we communicate. And, um, you know, in life generally, you've got LinkedIn, Facebook, got all sorts of things, Instagram, and goodness knows what. So it makes sense that, of course, psychotherapy or some of the healing uh, mechanisms, especially in a pandemic like this, uh, Zoom uh, was better than nothing. I, I also believe um, some of these other online therapies were better than nothing. Now, once we come out of the pandemic, 
do I believe that face-to-face -face therapy is better? Well, I'm not sure what I mean by better, but in my view, it's more authentic and more holistic and brings different dimensions. So I'm somebody who prefers face-to-face, -face, though I understand Zoom might be useful for people who find therapy unaccess inaccessible. In other words, they live a long way away or from the therapist or, or, or there's geographical things to be taken in consideration. Or people who uh, find it less uh, shameful or they find uh, Zoom easier to handle for lots of different ways, less anxiety, less stress. Um, do I email therapy? I, I don't mind all these therapies if people, you know, have them as a first port of call to reach out to like Samaritans for example which a lot of people uh, would but as a long-term ongoing therapy I think that um, there's nothing more potent or powerful than face-to-face -face therapy yeah I I like face-to-face -face. Mm. Mm. yeah mm. but like you say it's it's quite restricted in a way you know and, and for a therapist or a psychotherapist who lives in a little village you know it's it's quite difficult and the other thing that i think is worth mentioning from our point of view there's an awful lot of you know rules and regulations that we need to adhere to as psychotherapists that yes that's true you know word of mouth is a wonderful advertisement but often that doesn't work for us because you know if we're seeing one client then is it appropriate and ethical for us to see other members of that family or in yeah. somebody in their friend circle so it kind of narrows down yeah yeah and do you remember i said that there's at least 700 different types of therapists so uh therapies i mean so Zoom, email counselling, all these different types of social media counselling stroke therapies might be more applicable, for example, people who want to deal with cognitive change or people who want to deal with behavioural change. I think the more problem comes if the people wants to deal with emotional changes. And I think personally, again, they need to have an authentic relationship where they can get some actual uh, reparative healing that isn't so easy on social media outlets. Yeah. See, again, touching on that, I know this is probably going, and I'm going to write it down as I speak, because I think the next episode of the podcast, we're going to look at assessments. But do you think people know what it is that they want help with when Some, they come to therapy? Or yeah. is that okay. unpicked? I don't want to be patronising to the viewer, the reader here, or the listener uh, at all when I'm going to say this. Uh, most people think they do and they actually don't. But that was when you were saying it's whether they want to change emotionally or whatever. My instant thought was they probably don't even know what they want to change. They know they're in pain. Yes. Uh, they may feel depressed or to the level where they just feel there's a black hole and they don't know how to function. Do they know what's wrong? Probably not. Um, so then it's up to the therapist to be able to look and help the person beneath the actual layers so they can actually get some peace, harmony and healing. Is that better face to face? I believe it is. Yeah. However, I understand all the uh, necessities for social media uh, uh, in terms of uh, therapies. But once again, I think for cognitive therapies, even behavioral therapies, some spiritual therapies, I was thinking of meditation and yoga and all these sorts of things, Zoom, is, Zoom we could argue is pretty fine. But if we're then gonna talk about you know, emotional change and healing from trauma, I do think talking to somebody in front of you is more positive. And I am sure we will come back to this topic throughout. It will weave in and out of the next few episodes and beyond, no doubt. Mm. So I'm going to bring this one to a close. The next one is going to be around assessment um, and what happens behind closed doors in the therapy room. Yeah, and just to sort of end, uh, it should be very nice. Uh, I'm, I'm in a Zoom in Didsbury. And your Zoom, and I can't quite remember where you live, but it'd be very nice if, if we, when we end this, we both go and have a cup of tea 
uh, in the real world face to face because there's an emotional connection. 100%. Yeah, so 100%. I, I come down on the side though, I understand uh, the, the, the use of social media for other outlets. See, Thank just as you said that, Bob, something happened in me, and I'm not sure what that is. Maybe I need to take it to therapy. But I think the difference between me and you is because I've been in a room with you mm. and oh, I've yes. sat next to you yeah. and I've touched yeah. you and yeah. felt you. I've automatically got a connection with Give you. That memory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you're my constant object. I kind of I've brought you into the 2021 20, with me. <laughs> I understand all that. It's, an, it's a wonderfully interesting discussions we're having here. So I've got to come to a close, but the next one is on assessment and how we choose a therapist in terms of, uh, of that whole process. So that would be interesting again. 100%, because it's, it's unique to all of us, just like we're all unique individuals, we're unique psychotherapists and coaches yeah. and all that malarkey. Right, so I shall see you on the next episode, Bob. You will all look forward to that. Thank I resume from our different rooms. <laughs> yes, that's true. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode. <laughs>